uh, we'll go ahead and we'll get started. We're going today into, uh, oh, like we had in our outline sent out, we're going through a sudden so walky in him. If we'll look at Colossians chapter 2, and we'll go to verse 6, what we read here is, uh, we're starting at where it says, As ye have uh, therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as ye have uh, been taught, abounding uh, therein with thanksgiving. And so we see this uh, laid out and explained there. So pretty much what we're seeing is uh, the idea of walking in Christ. You know, so therefore, you know, walk ye in him. And of course, we know in the dispensation of grace, the way we preach Christ and understand Christ today is not going to be in the red letters of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Though we can, of course, always study them and learn from them, and they're a great benefit to us. But the way we're to preach Christ and to understand what he's doing today, who he is, is going to be according to the revelation of the mystery. And so we say that a lot of churches don't even know what that is. They don't even know when they read that verse uh, how to explain it, uh, why it's there, and uh, you know even more so what it, what it means. And those are pastors and churches. So we'll see there it's great to have knowledge of what the revelation of the mystery is. But we also want to build upon that knowledge and then have wisdom as a result of it so we can therefore you know, walk in Christ, have our walk be worthy to Christ. And so we're going to see what that is and uh, how that works you know, as we uh, plug in the revelation and the mystery into all Scripture, uh, rightly divide all the word of truth, uh, so we can go for, uh, you know, do this indeed upon uh, everything we come across, not just in Scripture, but all the details of our lives. So sometimes a question that comes up is, you know, how exactly are we going to go forth and do this? And we'll go over that today. So we'll go over that as we build up wisdom in the revelation of the mystery, and, you know, using it and applying it and putting it into, uh, into work, so to speak. Uh, we'll see, therefore, how we walk in him with the revelation of the mystery, you know, preaching Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. So we'll go first over the revelation of the mystery. We'll go over those six uh, concepts that have to deal with that, that have to do with that. And the first one is having to do with exactly what it is. And of course, uh, the revelation of the mystery is kind of what it sounds like. It's uh, after uh, when, when Saul of Tarsus was on his way to actually murder more of the little flock of Israel. You see that uh, he's knocked off his horse in Acts chapter 9, and the light shines from heaven, and, and God gives to Saul of Tarsus you know, a body of data, what we'll call uh, information. And within the information, it it's, takes, uh, takes some time for him to be given everything, but it's essentially you know, uh, some information or a lot of information from God to Paul directly. It's not through another man or a group of men or, or any of mankind at all, but from God to Paul with six pieces of information saying, since I died on the cross and now that I'm in heaven, Here's some things that have changed as a result of the cross. And so here's one of the first things is that anybody can be freely saved as a result of the cross of Christ. Now, that wasn't known by all men prior to God explaining this to Paul and Paul explaining this to everybody. So if we look at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 and 4, we'll of course read that there. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3. Just to know what the revelation of the mystery is, the aspects that are there. You see there it says that, uh, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. That's Paul talking. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So we know that's our gospel. That's our good news for today. So we're not going to go to John 3.16. We're not going to go to Acts 2.38. We're not going to go to Romans 10.9 and 10. Not to say that that's the gospel. Uh, our gospel for today it's gospels, it's good news for other people in other times and other dispensations. It's, you know, it may be good for them, it might be right for them and everything else, but for us today, when we want to preach Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, some of the information we can use to do so is going to be 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, in order to explain that, in order to help explain that. You know, talking about how you know, we are the church, the body of Christ, you can start out by saying, well, here's the gospel that the body of Christ uses. And that's 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, uh, the gospel that anybody can be saved freely by the work of Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection on the cross. We see that there. If we look at Romans chapter 3, and we'll go into verse 20. 
Romans 3.20 And we read more about what uh, the work of the cross has done and uh, more details in regards to that. It says in Romans 3.20, uh, Therefore by the deeds of the law, uh, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law it is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all, and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past, through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. You know, by what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. And so we see this mentioned here in Romans 3, 20 through 28, talking about how the law is not going to save us. You know, our works aren't going to save us. Doing the works of the law are not going to save us. And he says, uh, where's boasting? Where can you go around and boasting and saying, look what I've done, look what I've, you know, it, it's not here in the dispensation of grace today. When it comes to our salvation, when it comes into getting to heaven, you can't go around and boast about, look at me, look what I've done. Uh, religions do that all the time. And yet we see here, Romans 3.20, talking about how it's uh, his righteousness, the righteousness of Christ that everybody needs, because all have fallen short. Uh, nonetheless, we see anyone can be freely saved as a result of, the, of Christ and his cross work. And that's one of the first parts in regards to the revelation of the mystery. Uh, so we see this here. And so that's one of the first things we want to at least go over. And to see that concerning, you know, what the revelation of the mystery is, so we can walk in him. We can walk in Christ, according to Colossians 2.6. But another thing we can see, and this is really kind of the primary one, is that the body of Christ is the channel through which uh, God operates today based on the cross. If we look at Ephesians 1.22. Ephesians 1.22. And what we see here, concerning the body of Christ being the agency that God works through today. It's not going to be Israel. It's not going to be the Jews. It's the church, the body of Christ. We see there it says, uh, And hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. That's today. That's this dispensation right now. If we see more, that will cross-refer to this. We'll look at Colossians chapter 1, and we'll go to verse 16. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. Which here says, For by him were all things created, that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. So again, we see there in verse uh, verse 16, talking about how Christ is the creator of everything, universe, earth, heaven, everything. And then it says in verse 18, uh, and he is the head of the body, the church. He's, so when we talk about him, is he our good shepherd and we're a sheep? Or we're not sheep and he's not our shepherd, not in this dispensation, uh, but really not in any dispensation for us. But he is for other groups, other people in other times. He is their shepherd, and they are his sheep. We're not. He's our head, and we're his body parts. We're his members. We're members of his body. We're, we're members of his church. He's our head, and we're his body. Uh, who is the beginning, the firstborn from uh, the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. That's what we see here concerning uh, the fact that the body of Christ is the agency, the channel through which God works today. So, on top of knowing that anyone can be freely saved as a result of the cross, that the body of Christ is the channel through which God operates today. And so this is another part of the revelation of the mystery. When somebody says, you know, how do you preach Christ according to the revelation of the mystery? How do you walk in Christ according to the revelation of the mystery? What is the revelation of the mystery? We're going, we're going through that right now. So we're seeing, you know, number one is the first one. Number two, uh, the body of Christ. So now we go into number three. 
And we're seeing that it's not about Israel today. It's not about Christ in the flesh as Israel's Messiah today. So if we look at uh, Romans chapter 11, uh, verse 25. Romans chapter 11, verse 25. And I would say read all of Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11 if you want to see the uh, ultimate and grand total conclusion of how this came to be. Romans 9, 10, and 11 will explain everything. But Romans eleven twenty five is what we're going to zoom in on in order to get the piece of this puzzle, so to speak. And we see here the Apostle Paul is uh, writing, and he says, uh, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits. And we definitely don't want to be wise in our own conceits today. He says that blindness, in part, is happened to Israel. Israel is, in their status, blind today. Not only that, but when you read in Romans 11, they, they're blind, they've stumbled, they've fallen from their position. And uh, the Gentiles are currently the rulers, quote-unquote, uh, not Israel. Uh, eventually, that'll be flipped. And uh, in the ages to come, and and, uh, pro and prophecy will come back, and everything, and, and things will flip back, literally flip back, to where the Gentiles fall, Israel rises, and things go back later on. But that's not the way things are today. But in uh, verse 25, uh, that blindness in part is happened to, uh, to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. That's kind of what we were just talking about. The fullness of the Gentiles, everything will flip. And the fullness of the Gentiles will be coming. Gentiles will have their rule, their reign. They're having our, you know, Gentiles are having our day today. Everything will flip. And then Israel will rule. Gentiles will fall. It's going to be Israel's the head, not the tail. And everything will take up. The kingdom will come. Christ will be the uh, good shepherd, the king, things like that. The prophecy will continue. And uh, we're not in any of that. So we see this here. And then it says, so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written. It shall be something is a future thing. There shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. And so this is something that will be something that takes place. And so we read this there uh, concerning what's going on with the fact that it's not about Israel. They're, they, they're blind. They've stumbled. They've fallen today. And so we read that there. Um, and if we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 16. We'll go there, and we'll see that there's an important part we want to plug in as well. Paul teaches for believers today in this dispensation. 2 Corinthians 5, 16 says, Wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. And this is a big one, too, because Israel... Jews, when Christ was standing right in front of them, they were knowing him after the flesh. They saw him with their own eyes. They knew him. They were able to reach out and touch him, talk to him, speak with him, crucify him, do whatever they needed, you know, uh, you know worship him uh, physically. Uh, he was standing right there in front of them. Paul the Apostle says today, uh, Wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh. We're not to know somebody according to what they look like, but who they are in their heart, if we were to summarize it like that. Um, we read that there, and he says, hey, though we have known Christ after the flesh, there were people that did know Christ according to what he looked like and who he was. Uh, yet now, henceforth, know we him no more. Not like that we don't. We know, we know him as a risen, ascended Lord who is uh, in heavenly places right now, but we're to study who he is, what, what, what's he like, according to the words on the page of this book. And that's how we can know him. That's how we can understand him. That's how we can know what he's doing, what he once did, what he will be doing. Uh, he's not an unknown, mysterious God that we can just, you know, who is he? What's he doing? Uh, nobody can know. You can actually go in and study and go, oh, this is him. This is what he's doing. Now I can know. This is him. I can read the words on the page and clearly know who he is, what he will be doing, what he once actually did. And so we can study him knowing him. And so we know today he's not about Israel. He's not about being their Messiah. He's not anywhere in the world today in the flesh. You'll see so many people say, I'm, you know, a lot of cults will say, I'm Jesus Christ in the flesh, I've returned. And you'll see a lot of uh, cults get started that way because people don't know any better. Second Corinthians uh, 5.16 says, well, he's not going to come in the flesh. Not today he's not. Uh, he's risen, he's ascended, and he's dispatched us the body of Christ as his agency on a 
cursed and fallen world right now, uh, and that anybody can be saved as a result of what he did on the cross. And so those are the first three things we're seeing as a result of the revelation of the mystery, the body of data he's given to Paul to give to us. So we see this here, but then we go even further into having knowledge of what the revelation of the mystery is. And he's told the apostle Paul, you're going to be the pattern for everybody. And so people say they want to follow Jesus. Other people say, well, I'm going to follow this preacher, this pastor, this uh, priest, this pope, this, you know, they make up their different patterns for who they want to follow. God says, I've set up a pattern for every believer who wants to know how to follow me after the cross. If you look at 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 16. Another aspect of the revelation of the mystery is that Paul's the pattern. Paul's the apostle. Paul is the one that we go to for our instructions, our doctrines, our information that we need to know when we want to come to an understanding of, of what's going on today. We go to Paul. We want to read the daily, the most updated piece of information, the most updated uh, article in your newspaper, so to speak. Uh, in this case, if we're talking about the Bible, you go to Paul. You don't go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You don't go to Acts. You go to Paul. Paul's in Acts, but the books here are where we're going. So 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 16 says, I'll be for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. So he said, Paul is saying that, that God made me the pattern, that Paul was someone who was killing believers. Paul was at one point, he was Saul of Tarsus. He was going out killing believers and God saved him for no reason at all, aside from the fact that God is gracious and merciful and loving and said, I'm gonna save you. And then I'm gonna make you a member of my uh, body. And so this is the pattern in which you can, we can all look at ourselves and say, well, I didn't deserve to be saved but Christ did save me when I understand what the gospel is. I understand who my pattern is, the Apostle Paul. And now, through no, no um, acclamation of myself, through no boasting of my own personal life or my own personal self or my own personal uh, you know, endeavors or anything else, I can rejoice in the cross of Christ. And that Christ is the sacrifice, uh, a fully sufficient sacrifice done uh, in payment for my sins on, on my behalf. And so we see that there in Paul is the pattern. We see that there in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 16. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 37. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 37, he's also writing to the Corinthians. And as he writes to the Corinthians, there's something he's going to mention in verse 37 to them. Because there's lots of people that are in different religions and Christian circles and everything else, and they say that they call themselves, you know, spiritual people, or they call themselves prophets of God. And uh, they'll take those titles and labels and they'll call themselves that. Well, Paul says, you know, I'm the pattern. And if you're really going to say that you're a spirit or, or a spiritual person or whatever, he says here in uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 37, if any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. But if any man, any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. So he, Paul is flat out saying, if anyone's going to go out there and call themselves spiritual, uh, or you know, a spiritual giant, or a super prophet of God himself, they have to first acknowledge that who I am and what I write, or more so, what I write unto you are the commandments of God. If someone says, well, you know, I, I, I heard of Paul, but I don't really read him, or... You know, they, they don't know what God's doing today. Or if they say, well, I, 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 Paul, you know, I know Paul's in the Bible, but I really go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John for my instructions. They don't know what God's doing today. Or they don't acknowledge uh, what God is doing today, which therefore they're not acknowledging the purpose and plan of God himself. They're just, they're just kind of brushing it off so they can do what they want to do. And so Paul is saying, I am the pattern, which is a part of, of preaching Christ according to the revelation of the mystery so we can walk in him properly today. And so we see that there is the fourth aspect of the revelation of the mystery. Another one, if you look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10, we're going to see the fifth part. The revelation of the mystery is that in the end game of everything, Christ is all in all. 
And so whether we are studying prophecy and we'll go read Israel and the Jews and healings and miracles and all those things that you know once occurred and will occur again, but not today, or whether we are studying today the dispensation of grace with the Apostle Paul and there is no healings and signs and wonders and we rightly divide the word of truth and understand the body of Christ from the 12 tribes of Israel, we're going to see that in the end game, no matter what happens, Christ will be all in all. Christ will have all in all. Christ will rule all in all. And we see here in Ephesians 1.10, but in the dispensation of the fullness of times, and you can see a study on the dispensation of the fullness of times on our YouTube channel, uh, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we haven't obtained an, or we have obtained an inheritance. And it goes on from there, but you're seeing that he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Those are going to be all in Christ. It's going to be all in one kingdom of God, one system in God, so to speak. We'll call it, we'll quote, quote it as that. Uh, it's going to be all under one system, God's system. It's going to be in heaven and on earth and everywhere. The body of Christ will be in heavenly places. The 12 tribes of Israel will be on uh, the earth. It'll be all under one ruling, one kingdom, one system of God. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, and we'll see that this is another aspect of understanding the revelation of the mystery. The last one, look at Ephesians, we'll stay in Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians 1, 3, and it talks about how we have great and abundant riches in Christ. As saved members of his body, it's not just that we're saved and that's it, and then the end, and then it's, once we study our identity in Christ, what the cross has done for us, we see the great riches we have as the result of who we are. Now, we don't have you know, money and gold and silver and everything else. The riches come with understanding what the cross truly means. We see in Ephesians 1, 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ. So when people talk about, I'm so blessed because I have a, a new mansion, or I have a million dollars, or I have a thousand dollars, or I have a new job, or I have an old job, or I have a new car, or I have an old car, whatever it is, those are they, those pale in comparison. Those are nothing compared to understanding that we have all spiritual blessings given to us freely the moment we trust the gospel, and they're waiting for us in heavenly places. We will just one day, we will, whether we are caught up in a rapture, or whether we we go unexpectedly or expectedly into heavenly places, our riches are already waiting for us there. Our spiritual blessings, our identity in Christ, our seat in heavenly places. Our, we see this in Ephesians 2, 6, that uh, hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Our seat is already there. Our position is already there. Our riches are already there. Our spiritual blessings are already there. It's just a matter of getting plugged into those things. But they're already, we already have those things as we're sitting here in a present evil world that fails to acknowledge that. Uh, we can acknowledge that. We can understand we have those things. Those are already ours. And it's not ours because we've earned it. We didn't earn anything. It was freely given to us the minute we trusted the gospel and, and said, you know, I, I need something greater than myself. I need uh, a sacrifice far greater than myself in order to be in heaven with God forever. It's not going to come from me, ever. And it's the Lord Jesus Christ. His death, burial, and resurrection on the cross is a fully sufficient payment. And pays not just for the past sins that I've done, the present sins that I think or act out currently today. Uh, it'll pay for the future sins I've done, that I will do, five minutes from now, five years from now, you know, whatever it may be. Uh, fully sufficient payment of sins uh, is Christ's death, burial, and resurrection on the cross. So we see that there, that we have abundant riches. It's not only that our sins are paid for and forgiven, but then also things are added to on top of that to where our position in the heavenlies are set up for us. So God is saying, not only are your sins paid for, yes, you, you will be going to heaven, but when you get to heaven, you've got things already set up and ready to go. You're ready to rock when you get to heaven. So we see that there from Ephesians 1, 3, Ephesians 2, 6, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, and abundantly more verses than that. We're just going to this for today. But that is uh, the six aspects of the revelation of the mystery. Uh, so we can walk in Christ. Uh, this is what we, you know, this is what we preach. This is when we are to preach Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. We read that in Romans 16, 25, and 26. You ask somebody in a 
church today or in a Christian circle or in a Christian group or in a religion, what does that mean? They'll say, oh, I don't know. Or I think I know, but I'm not sure that I know. That's not good. That means they don't know any of these things we just went over. Not with crystal clarity. They might have some sort of mud in the way and they're trying to figure it out. And maybe they might know a little piece of the puzzle, but that's not good if they're still trying to learn what God's doing today because he's revealed it for the past 2,000 years. It's been fully made available to all of humankind for over 2,000 years. And people are, you know, the devil's doing, the devil's working overtime trying to blind our minds and, and distract us and get us you know, not learning, you know, what's going on. But uh, nonetheless, uh, that is uh, the revelation of the mystery that we see there. So as we go in and we see now, how can we walk in the details of the revelation? How can we preach Christ according to this? We're going to see that uh, if we already know this, then we're also going to see how can we teach this to somebody else. So the first step is, how are we going to walk in Christ? How do we walk in him according to Colossians 2.6? It's going to be, of course, walking by faith. Uh, but, you know, how exactly do we do this once we go from there? Uh, so again, if you already know this, this is a good refresher so we can teach this to somebody else. But it all starts with faith. Uh, step one is, of course, to have faith. So we'll just we'll start back from kind of square one. It's you know, to have faith. And that's a good start. You know, and not just superstitious, state, uh, superstitious faith in any anything, but uh, we or any doctrine or any any church or any religion or any any just anything in general. But uh, it's going to be in something intentional, something uh, you're aiming for a specific object, a specific uh, thing on purpose. It's faith in the gospel, which we went over a little bit earlier, First Corinthians fifteen three and four, uh, the right gospel. Look at Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. We're going to see here, it says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So we're going to need the word of God, and we're going to need to go ahead and study it and learn from it and, and read it and just put it in our inner man. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. This is going to be a result of what we do and how we do it. Step one is going to be by faith. We see that there. And it's going to be, of course, faith in the right gospel from the right Bible. It's going to start on how we get our walk going, you know, walking by faith. You know, so we see this here. And so it's going to be faith in the gospel, the right gospel. And if you look at uh, 1 Corinthians 2.14. We're all kind of starting out with faith as we kind of explain it to someone. Because after all, we see in 1 Corinthians 2.14, why that's a necessary first step. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, says, uh, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. And so in order to go from, say, the natural man to the spiritual man, it's going to take... You know, not only just trusting the gospel and, uh, you know, Romans 10, 17, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's going to take that, that study, that learning, that believing and having faith in what God has to say. Uh, but initial faith is going to come with that. And faith in the right thing, you're going to, you're going to aim them, so to speak, aim their faith, aim them as you speak with them and have discussions with them, kind of get them away from wrong things and target them into the right thing, which is Christ and him crucified. His death, burial, resurrection being that fully sufficient payment for all their sins. Uh, um, that's kind of where you go with them, but they have faith in that. And so that's, you know, initial groundbreaking. So, so when they want to have that discussion about why, you know, water baptism is so necessary and I'm not going to get water baptized the way they do it in that church down the street. I'm going to get water baptized in the way they do it on the church on the other street. That's a meaningless conversation if they're not even saved. You could win the conversation saying, well, I don't, we don't need to be water baptized at all. And you could put all your effort and energy into a discussion like that. But if they're not saved in the first place, then you're kind of wasting your efforts and energy on discussions that have no meaning if the person's not saved to begin with. Uh, so this is something where we focus, again, faith in the right object, uh, not in the wrong discussions. And you, you may have to bypass a couple of uh, you know, interesting discussions in order to get to the right thing in the first place. And that'd be faith in the right gospel. 
So we see that there, because after all, we know God would have all men saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. That's First Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. And that would be, you know, truth and having faith in the right gospel. So the first one gets saved by grace through faith, and then they come to the knowledge afterward. And, you know, all other issues are going to be secondary. So a lot of people like to say that the Bible is a big puzzle with pieces everywhere. And so having faith in those puzzle pieces will be a good start. And, you know, faith in the gospel and other various, we'll call it puzzle pieces. Uh, and then things will progress from there. But if we look at First Thessalonians chapter 2, and verse 13, this is a verse that helps you know, a lot of people to grow. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. And it says that uh, for this cause also, thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, he received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. And so they're saying that when you, when they received the word of truth, they received it not as the word of man. It wasn't just the word of uh, uh, someone, some ordinary human being just talking, but they knew that what they were hearing uh, through the scriptures was the word of God himself. And they believed it as such. And so they took it as such and went with it as such. So when instructions were given, they knew that this was the living, breathing word of God from the true and living God, uh, coming coming from, you know, say, the instruments of men, but they knew and believed it was the word. They had faith. It was the word of God. So this is how we are also to approach the word of truth. And having faith in the puzzle pieces is at least your, your initial start that you want to begin with. Uh, then the next one, going from faith, we're going to go into understanding. Now we want to get some understanding into those puzzle pieces that we're having faith in. And for that, one has to have faith in the puzzle pieces. Now would be time to connect them rightly or to, you know, as we're seeing it there. If you look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. This is, of course, where you can tell we're going with this. So you're studying, you read a couple times, or you read what it is, you know, Paul's epistles, whatever it is that, you read, you say, okay, I'm going to have faith in these puzzle pieces. You know, the Bible's a big puzzle. I'm trying to figure it out, but I have faith in it. I just, it's a matter of figuring it out. Well, this is where we come to in 2 Timothy 2.15, saying, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now it's taking those puzzle pieces and connecting them properly. You're not going to make your own picture, and you're not going to run off of somebody else's agenda or somebody else's picture. It's going to be what God wants us to do. And he says to rightly divide the word of truth. So we can bring that puzzle together properly. And we can understand. So we go from having faith uh, to going to the next proper step, which is to have understanding. And so as we do that, uh, we'll see that then we look at 2 Timothy uh, 3.16, next chapter over. Seeing that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished, unto all good works. So say so you're learning about what the Apostle Paul is doing today, uh, the revelation, the mystery, preaching Christ according to that, you can eventually, as, as you see fit, um, go back learn about the Old Testament, learn about Deuteronomy, Leviticus, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and everything else, and, and rightly divide that out, see what this is what God was once doing in comparison to what he's doing today, the Revelation of Mystery, the Apostle Paul, Romans through Philemon, and then go even further and say, okay, now I see what he's going to be doing in the ages to come with Hebrews through Revelation. You've got all 66 books at your disposal as you're understanding and rightly dividing, and now we're saying, okay, now this entire game plan of God or purpose and plan of God is making more sense. I'm having understanding as I'm believing and having faith in the word of truth. And so we see this there. But a lot of people will say, well, that verse doesn't really mean what it says. My pastor told me this verse really means this. Uh, my church group is telling me that not to really hang on to that because Paul didn't really mean what he said. James didn't really mean this. That verse doesn't truly mean that. It couldn't, because otherwise this would have to mean that. And this is where the lack of faith comes in, rather than actual faith and just believing what the words on the page have to say. And so we see this there. And so we look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 7, remaining in 2 Timothy. And he says, of course, in here, Paul says, consider what I say. As we go back to, of course, our pattern, knowing this from the revelation of the mystery. Consider what I say, and the Lord give the understanding in all things. 
So when you go back and we've done study on, we've done multiple studies in the book of Proverbs, we've done multiple studies on you know, multiple topics, uh, we would see that uh, the Lord would give us understanding in all things because we ultimately have an understanding based on what, you know, what Paul tells us, uh, what God's doing today. And so we can go back and see, oh, well, since we know what God's doing today, we can rightly divide that from what God was once doing, say, in Proverbs or in First Kings or in First Chronicles or Leviticus or otherwise, knowing that what he did was in the prophetic program, something different. And we can allow that to be different. We can allow the contradictions to take place, and therefore it's perfectly fine and okay, because we want that to be that way so we can have clarity in what God was once doing and everything will make sense. We consider what Paul says, so it, it gives us understanding. Uh, so we know that Paul's the pattern, and that understanding comes about by studying in this manner. We understand the puzzle pieces and we have faith in them. So now we're having faith in the right gospel, uh, from the right Bible, rightly divided. Now that's taking place. Third thing is it's going to start building up the next step, which is going to be knowledge. And so the puzzle pieces, now the puzzle is starting to take shape. And so we see what the big picture is starting to look like. And as we gain knowledge, and that's what's going to be taking place. If you look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17. Ephesians 1, 17. Now we're going from uh, faith to understanding and understanding to knowledge. Ephesians 1.17 says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. That's going to happen as we study, read, learn, rightly divide, and put together all the verses that make up uh, the word of truth, rightly divide. So we can learn this and have revelation and the knowledge of him. But the eyes of our understanding being enlightened, that uh, we may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward, who believe according to the working of his mighty power. That's what we're seeing in Ephesians chapter 1. So this is what we're reading here. If we get Philippians chapter 1 verse 9. Philippians chapter 1 verse 9 has some good points as well. It says, in this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in uh, all judgment. So again, when it talks about how can love abound in the dispensation of grace, it's going to abound in knowledge. The more you understand somebody uh, or something, in this case, the Lord Jesus Christ, what he's doing, uh, the more love can abound through that knowledge. And so knowledge is going to be an important thing through knowledge and in all judgment. And not judging as in you know, being a, a, uh, a rude critic or something like that. Uh, although, you know, again, showing grace sometimes means you do have to be, you know, someone may need that, that, that kick in order to get themselves going. Uh, but it's going to be more so having knowledge and judgment towards the situations around us and not ignoring them, not just pretending that they're not there. So we see that uh, this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. We see this. If you look at uh, Philippians 3.8. Philippians 3 8 talks about, uh, ye doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. And the, again, the point of putting all these verses together, rightly dividing the word of truth, having, again, faith in the puzzle pieces, so to speak, is to have that, uh, to win Christ, to have that knowledge of Christ. Uh, that, again, the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. Uh, for who, and Paul says, our pattern, suffers the loss of all things. He's willing to suffer the loss of all things that he would gain the knowledge and the wisdom. He's very happy to do that. So we see this here. This is what he's talking about. In Colossians, going back to this, Colossians chapter 1 again, verse 9, Paul's prayer for the Colossians we see here says that uh, for this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. And that's Paul's prayer for the Colossians. He didn't pray for them to per se... Uh, you know, have certain types of things or anything else, but we see it was all about the knowledge of his will and uh, all wisdom and spiritual understanding. 
Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. And so this is how we prayed that. Uh, let me see if there's an even better. If we look at uh, Colossians 3.10. Colossians 3.10, talking about putting off the old man and putting on the new man, which is something we definitely want to be doing. Uh, he says here, and, and put on the new man, which is how he's starting out in uh, Colossians 3.10. Put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge. That's how we put on the new man. We renew ourselves in knowledge. Again, by having faith in the puzzle pieces, understanding what they mean as we rightly divide the word of truth. If we're not rightly dividing the word of truth, we go to a church that doesn't rightly divide the truth, rightly divide the word of truth, uh, say, uh, study with people who don't rightly divide, then we're not going to be able to do these things. Um, put on a new man. We're not going to be able to put on the new man. We're just going to keep putting on wrong information. And that's what the old man was doing prior to even being saved. Uh, put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. And so we see that's a part of what we're seeing in Colossians 3.10. So we see this here, uh, that this is something taking place here. If we look at uh, Ephesians, Ephesians 3.4. We read in Ephesians 3, 4, uh, 3, 4, and it continues to talk about knowledge being the next step from faith to uh, understanding and understanding into knowledge. He says, um, whereby when you read, you know, you're writing to the Ephesians, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. And so this is kind of what we're going through today is having knowledge in the mystery of Christ. This is essentially uh, Ephesians 3, 4, in a sense, as well as Colossians 2, 6, so we can walk in, in Christ. We want to have that knowledge in the mystery of Christ so we can walk in Christ. But he's saying, uh, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. So Ephesians 3, 4, when God would have us to understand Paul's knowledge in the mystery of Christ, you know, we would have faith in the puzzle pieces, connect them, and then have knowledge of what the plan and purpose is, which would then lead us into the fourth and final part of you know, having wisdom and knowledge in the revelation of the mystery, which brings us to once you have... Uh, Faith in the puzzle pieces, you connect them, and you're having an understanding. Then you're applying that together, getting that knowledge going. Now you're going to have wisdom, and wisdom is going to bring us to you know what we want and where we're at. Uh, use of the knowledge we've gained from connecting the puzzle pieces. If we look at First uh, Corinthians chapter two, verse seven. First Corinthians chapter two, and verse seven. When it comes to use of the knowledge that we gain from connecting the puzzle pieces, now we're using that knowledge. We're using that understanding. We're putting it into use. We're using practical application of it. So it says, but we speak. So there's an a, a active verb there. We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world to our glory. So we're going to be speaking hidden wisdom to those that are lost, explaining the revelation of the mystery we just went over today. And so we're going to be doing this, um, and this is something that we're to you know actively do uh, using wisdom. That's going to be the result of it. If we go to Ephesians uh, five, verse uh, seventeen. Ephesians five seventeen. We're going to be redeeming the time because the days are evil, but verse 17 says, Wherefore be ye not under, unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. So we want to know what the will of the Lord is. And a lot of people will go around saying, well, you know, uh, I'm not sure what God's will is for my life, but I'm going to try to do the best I can. And I'm going to, well, you can actually go through and study the word of truth, connect the puzzle pieces, understand them, have knowledge of it, and then apply it wisely, walking worthy. And, uh, you know, this is you know, the point of what we're doing today. We want to be able to, head, uh, to go ahead and do this, uh, you know, being not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. So we see this here. Ephesians 2.2, you know, what we base our uh, ministry name on, we base our, our studies on. Colossians 2.2. As well, what we read there is so uh, says that uh, their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding. There's our understanding again, 
uh, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Again, there's wisdom, there's knowledge, there's understanding, there's all those things listed in these two verses right here. And so we're seeing that it's uh, it's in Christ that are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge that we want to go ahead and just open up and uh, study out and learn all about and, you know, apply that. So when we go forth and, and uh, sometimes as you grow into the word of truth and learn it and study, people say, well, you, you're so wise uh, and things like that. It's not us. It's us applying the wisdom of Christ. We're learning from the words on the page. And that's what it is as we go forth and grow in the knowledge of his truth. It's his gift he's given us. It's his truth. It's salvation he's given to us. It's his work on the cross. It's everything that has to do with the person of Christ, uh, who is you know, the Son of God, that we're you know, preaching according to the revelation of the mystery, and therefore we're walking it. And so these are practical applications. It's the practical application you're doing after you have the uh, faith, the understanding, and the uh, knowledge. So if there's no practical application, there may need to be more uh, studying, more with a more uh, understanding and more knowledge. And so you can gauge yourself personally on where you're at with that, but if there's not so much practical application going on, you may have to go back and study some more. That's right? just up to you as to, you know, you know yourself where, where you're at, I know where I'm at, where I'm going. Can we examine ourselves, as Paul says to do. So we see that there. We see a lot of other things here. First Corinthians 2, the whole chapter pretty much explains a lot about this. Uh, so sometimes we want to know the why. When it comes to the mystery and God's truth are so important, this is explaining it here. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of times where a lot of things is just Bible memory. And it's, it's about finding out, you know, unintentional information or information that really doesn't really mean anything. If you look at... Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 7, there's a trap that people can fall into. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 7. This is a trap we want to avoid. It says that uh, people can be ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. So they can be people studying, as uh, we've heard before, and there's ministries that do this, where they study how deep is the river, and uh, and uh, how deep was uh, you know the Nile River in Egypt that uh, Jews were around during the time when they were in Egyptian captivity? How deep is uh, the river in Jerusalem? How hot is the weather over there? And you're learning all these things that have nothing to do with salvation. And if you want to know it, that's great. That's, that's you know, interesting to know. It might be a little bit of uh, help, but if that's all you're doing is learning pieces of information, you know what color was uh, you know David? King David's hair, and how long did he have it, and why did he do it? I mean, all these different things that you can ever be ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And if you're never able to come to the knowledge of the truth because you're learning all these other different things, that can be a bad thing as well. If you're never coming to the knowledge of the truth, that's not, you're never coming to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, where all men are to come to the knowledge of the truth and uh, be saved as a result, and then the cycle continues to see souls saved and see saints edified. So we see there that we want to have faith, that we want to have understanding, that we want to have uh, knowledge, and then as a result of all this, the wisdom to go forth and see other souls saved and see other saints edified. So we want to avoid the trap, and we want to make sure that even when we're evangelizing, we watch out for certain things in our evangelism where we don't want to get into meaningless debates about certain things. We want to make sure that salvation is the first and foremost thing that we're going out there to do. Uh, you know, people will try to ask you questions, you know, why, why, was, uh, why did this person say this, and what, what does this mean, and why is this happening? If the person's not even saved or able to understand why they're saved, then you want to avoid all those conversations because they're meaningless. Uh, if, they're, if, not even, if you're not even sure of their soul salvation, uh, you want to avoid certain topics, if not every other topic, because it's, it's meaningless. If they want to debate you and fight you, on certain things, then just let them win the battle. Just say, okay, hey, you win. Can we go back to the topic of salvation? I'm not here to see how many fights I can win. Um, I'm here to see that you understand what the gospel is and see that you understand what the gospel is. Even if you understand it and you don't like it, I want to make sure that you understand it. You can understand it and then say, I hate what you're saying because the point is for you to understand it. Uh, if you don't like it, again, that's your call. That's up to you. Uh, I'm here to present the information with crystal clarity 
And if you get it and it makes sense and you still don't like it, at least I did my job and I presented the information to you. Uh, if you don't like it, that's, that's your call. If you do like it and it makes sense and it clicks and it works, then that's even better. We can continue to go forward and have greater conversations and greater uh, understanding. Again, we can go from faith to understanding and understanding to knowledge and knowledge to wisdom. And we can, we can build on that and walk in Christ, Colossians 2.6. Again, preach Christ according to the revelation of the mystery and kind of go forth from there. So, see that there that we want to go ahead and do this. Now, if we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and uh, verse 6. 2 Corinthians, I'm, uh, 7, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7. Ultimately, what we want to see is in having that worthy walk. Second Corinthians 5 and verse 7. So we're seeing that God would have us, of course, walk in wisdom as an end result. You're redeeming the time and that we would walk by faith in Christ. And that the faith would have to be, of course, you know, understood. And it's not going to be that, again, mystical faith. People, you hear different religions talk about faith being a mystical thing. You can't really know, but it's actually something you can know. You need to study and have a logical understanding of what God's doing because we have the words on the page that will teach us this. And so we see there it's going to be a necessity that needs to be understood. And so we're not going to be having faith in the law to save us or religion to save us or, you know, a list of requirements to save us. Second Corinthians 5, 7 says we walk by faith, not by sight. And again, so when you get back to seeing, you know, what God is doing today, what God's not doing today, we walk by faith, not by sight. Again, when people say, you know, I went to church and I saw three people get healed today, they saw it by sight, not by faith. Now they're walking the opposite way. And so, again, that, that means they're not having paused their pattern. They're not understanding the revelation of the mystery. Uh, they're not doing these uh, other things that we're seeing. So it's going to be walking by uh, sight, not by faith. We want to walk by faith, not by sight. And that comes with taking in the understanding, putting it into knowledge, knowledge into wisdom. And that's going to be another part of the wisdom that comes along with understanding the doctrine, teaching the doctrine, getting conversations about the doctrine, understanding God, who he is, his purpose, not only in time past, but what he's doing today and what he will continue to be doing in the ages to come. And then what he would have us do in our identity as believers and ambassadors and soldiers and workmen in Christ as members of his body. So we see that that would be the walk that we would have. That would be how we walk in him. So as we walk in him, walking in him, Colossians 2, 6, to kind of go back to that verse, we see that this would be uh, the point and the purpose. This would be the how that answers that question we went back to in our initial introduction. Now, how, how is this to be accomplished? How is it that an ambassador or believer is to not only know it for uh, themselves, but to maybe even teach this to somebody else when we see, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, which was we received him by faith, uh, as according to God's grace, not the law, not anything else, so walk ye in him, again, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. This is the uh, answer to that. This is how we walk in him. So walking in him is the result of what we're seeing here. So with that, we'll uh, stop here a little bit early, see if there's any thoughts or questions or comments on this. Uh, again, a good lesson to go through, kind of see how you go from kind of step one to step four. And uh, see if there's any thoughts, comments, or questions on that. John, I always have a question uh, when you present the gospel. So you talk to people of different, uh, what they consider, what most people consider Christian faith. Um, and they say, yeah, I believe that Christ died on the cross for my sins. We're on the same page. But you're really not, right? I mean, there's more to it than just that. So you need to continue the discussion. Am I not correct? Or yeah. Okay, because I mean I say that to people and then they say, Yeah, we, we believe that. But you know, then you know deep down inside they still feel they have to have sacraments or go to church or tithe or so you need to continue the conversation. It's not just presenting the gospel. I guess once you present it, at least you know they they believe in Jesus as opposed to Allah or Buddha or okay so that's the first step right and then you take it further by asking them more questions or 
Well, what you can do is this. Because I don't feel comfortable just leaving it with the gospel and throw it away. I would. You would, it would depend on, if you know who you're talking to, if you're talking to a Catholic, if you're talking to whoever it is, and they say, I believe that too, uh, you know, say Catholic, whatever, then you know roughly where they, they, they believe in the church, the Pope, the sacraments. Mm -hmm. And so they can, as soon as you present the gospel, you read 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, and everything else, it didn't, it didn't, it didn't hit. It, you read it. And they said, "Oh, yeah, because they've got they got crosses all over their sure. their religion, yeah. and so at least that's a step in the right direction. And even that's barely calling it that. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's it lets them visually see what you're trying to say. It's like there's Christ on the cross, but that means something. That's not just a picture you put on your wall, and then mm -hmm. you know that's the uh, end game. But what you can say is after they say, well, I believe that too. I believe Christ died on the cross and paid for my sins.'" And we believe the same thing. Now, what they don't know is that they just signed their own, you know, uh, they kind of just killed it for themselves. So you can say, oh, good. So now you know what they roughly believe. Everyone believes something a little different, but yeah. you can say, oh, so you uh, believe just as I believe that Christ died on the cross and paid for our sins and that there, there's no need for sacraments. There's no need for um you know, church attendance, there's no need sure. for confessions, yeah. there's no need for priests. You believe that just as I believe that too, and now there should be another discussion. Yeah, okay. And if you're talking to Jehovah Witnesses, you can say, oh, now, so there's no need for the Watchtower Society to watch yeah. over my body as God comes and rules and wrath and destroys the earth. Or if you're talking to a Mormon, also, there's no need for spiritual wives and there's no need for, uh, you know, the, uh, you know the, okay. the, the space station collab and everything else. And they'll be... So you do try and push that, but a lot of times they'll just they just shut down after that year. We're on the same page, and you know, well, but that's should, there. It's on them. Yeah, well, it's on them, but they shouldn't say yeah. that. They should say, "Well, well, now wait a minute." They should at some point say, "No, mm -hmm. they should say, mm -hmm. you know." But you're trying to get them to because uh, first they'll say, "Oh yeah, we're on the same page." Yeah. Christ on the you know they'll say, "Oh my my religion has Christ on the cross." You really because Christ on the cross for some religions is like Christ, Jesus had a bad day. But now we're going to have a good day, and there's no salvation in any of that. Mm -hmm. Or that Jesus was, uh, Jesus died, you know, for this, but now there's that, and there's really no explanation of what you know, things are. Yes. So, but yeah. Okay, because so, I, I do try to push it, but a lot of times say. You don't, you don't want to push it either. Cause, well, I don't mean push it as aggressive, but with love. Like you said, at or with charity, with grace. Yeah, yeah. you know that kind of thing. Yeah. Because so, I had someone say to me the other day that Christ was the perfect man. Well, I mean, he was that, the perfect man, but there's a lot more. Than just yeah, that. I was just, and I, that's what I sent back to. Him. Yeah. Yeah. One hundred percent man, one hundred percent God. Perfect sacrifice. Yeah. 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 And crickets after that. Yeah. Yeah. That'll happen. So yeah, any other thoughts or questions? Kind of just did our study Colossians 2.6, good study. I have a question, mm -hmm. I guess. Um, I This week, I think I'm going to have a chance to talk with the King James. You know, that's always a knee-jerk reaction to people. If you bring up the King James, then you're that kind of person. And um, a legalist or whatever, I don't know what they call you. How do you... Is there, I think I've asked this question before, but I'm still struggling. How do you show them, is there one instance in the King James where you can show them a definite difference between their version and our version that will that will turn the light bulb on? Just one condensed, you know? It's actually going to depend on the individual what's going to make it or break it. But there's so many, I'd say there's thousands of uh, verses that have been erased and changed. And so and so I could give you know a list of verses, but I'm not sure what. And they would have to be willing to understand that those verses have been erased intentionally and on purpose, as opposed to, because uh, you could show them, again, you could show them the, the changes all day, and they could just say, well, you're just, nitpicking the words without understanding that those words have been erased on purpose. Well, the thing is, for one thing, I'm not good with too many choices, and there's too many choices there. Um, the other thing is, I know there's like, is it Mark 8, 
that's missing verses? Or is it Luke 8? And, and, and there's the numbers are still in there, but the verses are gone. To me, to me, that helps to prove something's wrong. Something's different between yours and mine. I think in Mark chapter 16, because they take away the entire resurrection, and because they don't want to have a resurrected Jesus, uh, that would mean he's God. Um, and that's that's Mark 16. Well, the, th the reason, the thing I would like to talk, and, and I've been listening to Justin quite a bit about preservation and the different versions, and he doesn't so much say they do it on purpose. He's saying that that's a possibility, but let's just talk about the fact that they were using a different text yeah, yeah. Um, instead of pointing fingers and accusing them of purposely eliminating this and that um, they were using a different text so i guess i wouldn't want to go into that they're doing this for nefarious reasons but i wanted to go more into the text they were using is not the preserved text which to me is a little easier to talk about because if you explain that preservation is something that's been available throughout history so that we can obey it, and then you go back and say this text has been hidden, you know, for these, to me, that's kind of a laying it out nice and simple and straightforward without accusing anybody of anything except for that they've got the wrong text. Yeah, yeah, and it's uh, manuscript evidence. If, if, you can, if you can easily present manuscript evidence in a certain way, then I would, I would say go for it. But then I would like to go into right division with him. And where do you start? What's the easiest, simplest, so, just to turn just to turn the light bulb on? I would say that uh, Paul says this in Romans 4, James says this in James 2, and show him that there's uh, clear differences. Whereas he could say, uh, being in the Baptist church, that those verses say the same thing. Uh, but then you can take a list of contradictions and say this verse says this, this verse says that. Um, and then as you constantly show contradictions, then. Well, in his court, so how would you explain not only, you know, this contradiction, but these other 100 contradictions that are in the Bible and right division explains it all. But uh, if he if he's kind of stumbling. Uh, you could say, well, could I explain these to you? Uh, could I explain that uh, this verse, 2 Timothy 2.15, talks about rightly dividing the word of truth, and that there is indeed two plans uh, in the Bible, prophecy and mystery, and that they uh, illuminate all these verses and allow them to be true. And um, But, you know, the James 2, uh, Romans 4, uh, initial uh, one is a way to start, and then all the contradictions in general, um, are the way to go forth with that from there. Okay. Uh, when we when we uh, check out all this information, we're growing and we're learning and we're getting all this information. We we uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. We're just by the time we present it to somebody else, they're they're overwhelmed now because they've never even uh, taken a look at the uh, ocean of information that we've been given. Uh, let's see, I'm on I'm on Justin's page right now. Okay. Find the page. And I'm gonna throw. Oh, there we go. This is what I want right here. Uh, let me count. How do I? There we go. This is what. There's some good. Uh, a list of. Probably a hundred contradictions where you could say this is meant for Israel and the prophecy program. This one's meant for their law program. This is for our grace program. Uh, you know, stuff like that. Through Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, and prove that when they're talking about his death, wait, the cross, they don't talk about the cross. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. When I went with one person through those, it seems to me like the light bulb kind of came on, like we're talking about different. There is a difference. Mm -hmm. When I took them through the Gospels and showed them that those were not about the death, burial, and resurrection that we believe today for salvation because they didn't understand it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. The best, the best one I say is Luke eighteen thirty one. 
um, shows that Jesus says, well, I'm going to be, in, in a couple of days, I'm going to be going down to Jerusalem, and I'm paraphrasing. I'm going to go to Jerusalem, I'm going to be flat out crucified, and I'm going to die on a cross, and in three days I'll rise again, and the twelve look at him like he's crazy. And they say, what are you talking about? And uh, and it's just, that's what the, the verses are saying, that they understood none of these things, everything was hid from them. Um, and those are, that's you know, what it says in Luke 18, 31 through 34, uh, but then that's a way to explain how the cross is something that's hid, the meaning of it, the understanding of it, the revelation of it is hid during that time. Um, but again, I'm not sure if you're asking more so about the cross or the King James version, because the King James, it, the, the words may or may not say the same thing in an NIV, uh, but again, it's going to come back to so much more. It's going to be eroded and destroyed in an NIV than in a King James Right. Well, yeah, I guess I don't know where to start. I feel like I have a few different issues to talk to him about, and I don't want to offend, but I, I don't know how to do that with someone that's new to it. Yeah. Um. I, like I said, it kind of helped me go with one person through the fact that when they're talking about the gospel in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, it's not the same gospel that Paul is talking about because they didn't recognize the cross. Yeah. So to me, that was an eye-opener to me, myself. Mm -hmm. And so I guess that's one thing uh, it, it I would try to walk him through those different verses that show they didn't understand the cross, so that can't be our salvation message. Yeah, Peter didn't want Jesus to go to the cross. Yeah. And, and you're, doing, you're doing the right thing. I, I would say there's no, no wrong way to do it. And, and you're right, too. A lot of what we're teaching is, is very offensive to you know, the different religious groups that are out mm -hmm. there. Yeah, and I've always kind of done the same. As far as when it comes to discussions, you, you don't have to win the debate like the first time, or you don't even have to win the debate first couple times. You can, you can uh, you know, present the information and then ask them a question as to you know, why, why wouldn't this seem correct. And they can start saying, well, I learned this here and I learned this there. And you can just start talking about what they learned, when they learned, why they learned it, uh, how they learned it, who taught it to them. And in discussion can go a certain route and they can, you, you're just engaged in conversation. That's, that's actually, you know, an important thing too, to be having the back and forth. And, uh, and in the end they can say, well, I've heard what you said and I'll have to do this another day because I'm not ready to, uh, latch on to what you're saying. You could say, not a problem. I'm not, you know, to, to force you to believe what I'm saying is not never going to work. So, uh, and you don't say it like that, but um, what I mean is, is, you know, I'm glad we established a conversation and a dialogue. I'm happy to bring this up again sometime. And that type of thing. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay. Well, yeah, just be praying for me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I also, if no one else has a question, I'll wait a minute and see if anybody else does something. Yeah. Is somebody have thoughts or comments or questions or anything? Yeah. I was going to say, um, it might be good to go through like the New Testament that it's to Israel and um, that might, that might be a good way. Right. I think. I think that something we would go into is the divisions themselves. But I think if I slam him with that right away without the light bulb going on in his head, that's why I thought going through um, the Gospels and showing that the Gospels are different than what Paul uses as a Gospel. I thought maybe that would help him to turn the light bulb in his head without me blasting him with differences right away. Like, oh, there's something here I haven't seen. Maybe there's more. Yeah, yeah. yeah we always kind of hope that'll be something. It's, it's something worth, I mean, everything is worth trying. Yeah. 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 yeah it's, just a, it's just a matter of what they're looking to, to I guess, receive or looking for, look what they're looking for as far as, you know, the kind of growth they're looking for, or the kind of questions they might have, um, that kind of thing. So many people say that there are many ways to God, you know, and uh, of course we understand that that's not true. Yeah. But 
And that's what a lot of people feel. So when you talk to them about this way, they'll say, well, that's fine, but there's many ways to get to God, and I'm, I'm choosing this path here. Yeah. Well, yeah. Even, even with the Baptist, the Baptist believes Jesus Christ and the cross. They get that much, usually. Mm -hmm. And whether it's through John 3.16 or because they, they'll mix Paul with, with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, yeah. and they'll get a little bit of, you know, they'll get prophecy mixed with, but they'll get the that, that much, you know, in there. They just but get generally it. speaking, they won't get the right gospel. No, no. They, will get, they will get John 3.16. They, they will get that. That's what a Baptist yeah. is told. I mean, they don't understand there's more than one gospel in Scripture. Yeah, no, no, they'll be told John 3, 16, and then next Sunday they'll be told 1 Corinthians 15, 3, and 4, and then they'll be told Acts 2, 38, and then it'll jump. It'll jump. I don't, I don't think they see any difference between John 3, 16. Yeah. So that's why, to me, it would be eye-opening to show them there is a difference. There was no cross uh, in John you know, 3, 16. So that's, to me, like I said, one of the things that might turn the light on. Exactly. One of the things that's always turned a light on for me, Galatians 1, the Galatians 1, 10, 1, 12. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's always been a big thing. Well, actually, before that, it uh, starts with uh, verse 6, Galatians 1, verse 6. It says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from what from him that called you in the grace of Christ unto another gospel. You know, and then he and then Paul goes on to say that that gospel is the only gospel for today. So I don't know how and and when you when you look at what Paul's talking about as far as his gospel goes, you can take him from here, take him over to Ephesians, uh, Ephesians 15, 1 through 4. I mean, in that, that's Second Corinthians, Corinthians 15. Sorry. One, okay, two. yeah, I know what you mean, though. Yeah, go, go over that. And I think that makes it pretty clear that there's only one gospel for today, and that's the gospel. He doesn't say there's more than the gospel. He says there's one gospel. He says if you preach any other gospel, then you're wrong. He said, let it be a curse, but then clarifying what the gospel is to begin with is the hard part. Because yeah. if yeah. people will say, I, there is only the gospel. Go Ephesians, you know, I mean, go to Ephesians, you know, one thirteen, and it, and it tells you the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. So there is a gospel of your salvation. So yeah. you've got to know what that gospel is. But then the battle. Is that people will say, well, the gospel of my salvation is getting water baptized and joining the church and doing all my work. And, you know, they'll mix it and they'll, they'll twist it. But then they're always going to run to Paul and say those verses you just said, too. So they're going to struggle on that. Yeah. That's just, that's what's out there. Yeah. Well, yeah, there's a lot of it. It's an uphill battle. It's an, but, but yeah. you know, I think there are verses there that that, that can help you overcome some of them. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Your heart and mind have to be open to listen in here. And then faith comes by hearing and hearing yeah. by the word of God. So it's going to take the word of truth, you know, presenting the word of truth, you know, preaching the word in season and out of season. The word of truth is what's going to possibly, you know, break through. Or, you know, whereas our words may not, God's word will break through where we never could. So. Well, and then the other question that I have is, um, I have the, I have five grandchildren, uh, eight years old, down to two months old now. And how, okay, I'm sitting face to face to a child. How do I tell them the gospel? There's, there's um, 
So if uh, Sister Kino's books, if, if they're into reading or coloring, there's there's the uh, the books that, that uh, Terry McLean's wife wrote. And those are the coloring books with the illustrations, and they go into everything about uh, uh, Paul and the gospel, and they make it real, you know, childlike as far as the coloring yeah. kids and the explanation of the gospel through that. Well, well are, I can see that from an eight-year-old, and actually I did that when her, with her when she was seven, but it was it's such a long book, the one that we did, that she got distracted before I got to the end. So I guess I need, a, and, and I think that would be a book to build on yeah. what the simple gospel would be. But I just, what I did this last week when we had them together was tell them about the word gospel. I started to explain, you're going to hear the word gospel. And this is what gospel means. It's good news. There's only one good news that saves us today. And, um, then I'm trying to quiz them as to, so what did I say the gospel was, you know, about Jesus Christ dying on the cross that, and, but I guess I want something, like I said, I got eight on down to two months old, so they're not going to sit still for those long books. Yeah. I need something short and sweet. Well, I'm thinking back to what uh, Carol did when uh, she was, when she has, there's a, there's a lesson on uh, DBI about teaching children. And Carol teaches for about, I think, 55 minutes how to teach adults how to teach. Each children. Oh. And one of the things she does is she, uh, she asks, or she gives a scenario where she says that uh, she talks to a child and she says, I'd be very happy to uh, you know, cut myself and shed my blood for you uh, to pay for your sins. Is that okay? And, uh, and they're like, oh, no. And the child said, you know, oh, you can't do that. You have sinner's blood. And that should be something of a response that goes like that if they understand the gospel. Uh, otherwise, if they said, yeah, go ahead, then you'd be like, uh-oh, you know, something's not being understood. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of them wouldn't understand that at this time. I guess what I, the best thing that I've heard lately on this was by David Reed, and he showed a children's, simple children's book they made up. But he also said that tell the gospel over and over and over and over again, because when they come to the age of understanding, that's when they, you know, need to be saved. And when they start to recognize what a sin, what sin is. And uh, I mean, my eight year old is beyond that point. So I want to make sure I'm driving home what the gospel is. I don't, I don't feel that they know what it is, even though they go to church. I don't know that it's been made clear to them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, this is it here. Let me see if I can, uh, I'm going to try to bring it up and put it as a bookmark. Yeah. So share, let me see if I can share this, let me copy this link. Right. Where are you putting it in the um, messenger? Uh, well, I'll see if I can put it in the same places I put that other thing. Chat. This is uh, Carol teaching uh, how adults can teach children. Okay. And so I put that there. I'll put it in the general thing, too. So I'll put it in two spots. I don't know if you can see it. Let me go see him. Yeah, I see it. I yes. see it. So she teaches, uh, she teaches us how to teach the kids. Okay. Yeah, that's what I need. And I guess the little ones, I would let it, I would let it uh, just be hurt. They won't be sitting there listening attentively because they're distracted easily when they're three. But if they hear me talking to the older ones when we're eating dinner together is when I'm trying to do it over and over and over again, they'll catch it, you know, so it won't be a surprise or something they've never heard. So, and then he had said to ask a series of questions because by the questions you can know if they actually have the information. Yeah. So I just, I just wondered what your thoughts were on that whole. I think that makes sense. I think that's a good, that's a very good way to do that. And uh, whatever they say is kind of how you're going to have to gauge where they're at and their understanding. And then you just build on it, keep going from there. But I would say that's great because if if you can keep building on their understanding, even if they're not understanding everything, say this week, it's something right. you want for next week, and you just keep building and building and building. 
and it's going to be what what works. I, I keep thinking about some of the verses that I've heard all my life and just gleaned over, you know, like some of the ones that John talked about, uh, and and it was. How, how did I not hear this? You know, like that Peter didn't want Jesus to go to the cross and yeah. and so on. You know, how did I not hear this? Because I either wasn't open to it, I wasn't listening. I, I mean, a myriad of things. But one day, it hits. Yeah. So your repetition is awesome. Yep. Yeah. So I guess I guess that's what I'm gonna gonna try to do. Just keep repeating it through the years, and hopefully they all catch on. And then, like I said, ask questions to see if they're really understanding. That's a good point. That's a good idea. So, and there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that at all. You know, asking questions and, and I mean, that's what we do with adults is we, we repeat it. We ask them questions and, and that's, that's kind of where we go. You know, it's like a ministry of questions. So, yeah, and I know David Reed had some questions that he told you to use to ask, so I'm going to go back and look at that because, like I said, my mind, when I get too many choices, mm -hmm. I can't choose. Yeah. yeah, those are, you know, good things. Those are good uh, questions. You can ask the questions. You can see, uh, you know, what somebody's you know, thoughts are on the matter. And even if they say uh, something totally contrary to Scripture, that's where you're going to start with as far as ministering the right doctrines from the right Bible rightly divided to them. So that's that'll be that'll be a great thing. That's a great way to start. Okay, good. Well, thanks for discussing that with me. Yeah, yeah, anytime. Hey, thanks for asking. It's something we all learn from. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. Any any other uh, thoughts or questions? We're just looking to kind of go through and see some some new new faces of joy here. So we're, we're glad everyone's here. Yeah. Let's see. Let's see. Didn't know if there's any uh, anything else. We're almost uh, we're almost kind of wrapping up. But if there's, uh, we kind of just did our lesson for today. We did our uh, Colossians two six study, and uh, yeah, we're we're just looking to see if there's anything else. We'll be we'll be back here uh, Wednesday, but of course at four forty five, I've got my crazy schedule where I work at the uh, Orlando airport from. Now I work from three in the morning until one in the afternoon. So I've got Sunday off for perfect to do this on Sundays right here. And then uh, Wednesday, I'm gonna hop in 4.45, see if anyone can make it for a study then. And I might do it just from 4.45 to six. So we still have the Wednesdays and the Sundays where we can all meet up and we can all ask any questions that we might have as we're studying the word of truth, um, you know, comments and anything else. But uh, I don't know if anyone had any. Uh, Hmm? Yeah. Do you hear me? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I want to make sure I didn't cut out. No, this this is uh, Sebastian or Thad. Um, I joined I think maybe a year ago or something. Haven't really been on. Uh, been busy with work. Um, but yeah, no, I was gonna uh, just make a last minute comment that you know over the time that I've been. You know, still studying, listening, uh, watching the YouTube videos, things like that. I, I usually don't watch much of anything else except for maybe Justin and then Grace Bible Ambassadors, uh, things like that. So a lot of that learning comes from that. And it, it's just, uh, you know, over the, when I first joined and then first learned about all this, it made everything so much easier to understand. And, uh, you know, I grew up in a Church of Christ. I think I mentioned this to you a while back. I grew up in Church of Christ and uh, tried the Pentecostal thing. Uh, was in the uh, uh, word of faith movement type thing. Didn't even realize it until, you know, because I, I knew there still wasn't something right. Uh, I, I've come to the conclusion that the reason people, you know, past, or people that call themselves preachers or pastors, the pulpit uh, uh, money makers, is because they know that they would be out of a job if they preach the tr truth. If they preach the truth, nobody come to church anymore. Everybody be realizing that they are the church if they are truly saved and part of the mystery of the body of Christ, uh, and that uh, that's all. That's all it is. It's always about money. Yeah. Uh, I, I, you know, the Baptist church I was going to about a, six months before I started. You know, before I ran across Justin. Uh, he's the first one. It took me about three weeks to really comprehend. I kept listening, listening, listening. I was like, wow, this is crazy. Like uh, y'all were saying, there's things that you can hear lots and lots of times and go wait a minute 
what? How could I have missed that? Because it's so indoctrinated that you just assume whatever anybody's saying up behind the pulpit is telling the truth. You're just like, yeah, okay, you know, you're, you're repeating the same thing over and over again. And then you wait and you go home. And uh, until you really hear somebody start, you know, preaching what they what they know to be the truth, the mystery, the right division, all that. And it's like, wow, now it makes perfect sense because there are contradictions in the Bible if you don't know how to rightly divide. And uh, but the Bible is not uh, does not lie and it doesn't, you know, tell one untruth about another. It's all truth. It's just you got to know right where the grace part is and where the prophecy part is. Um, I've, I've also come to the realization it doesn't bother me when somebody doesn't want to know the truth. They don't want to listen. They aren't interested because I already, I already know that not everybody's going to make it anyway. Um, there's a lot of people that are stuck in their ways. You know, I look at it like this. That's like trying to go into a predominantly Catholic uh, uh, country, you know, like Mexico, and trying to tell everybody about the gospel of grace. Two, three people might accept it. Everybody else, nope, because they're stuck in their traditions, the family. There's all kinds of issues and things that pop into that. Uh, but yeah, no, that's that's what I wanted to uh, just mention on that. You know, e even family, you know, when family members, I know there are some that probably will not make it because they don't want to accept the uh, the truth. You know, they still like their friends. They like going to a man-made building called a church, things like that. So it's just, you know, not, not everyone's going to make it. Is it sad? Yeah, but... Is that the way it is? Yeah, I'm just doesn't it doesn't really bother me anymore like it used to. And uh, um, you know, some people might think that's harsh, but unfortunately, you know, then I just I remind myself it's like days of Noah. You know, only eight people out of millions and millions were saved because yeah, not anyway. That's all. But I just I wanted to say pop in and say hi because I got a little message on the Discord saying hey they're having a meeting. I'm like oh, okay, well I'm not doing anything. <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in and say hi. Yeah, yeah, nice to meet you. you. Yeah, nice to meet you. Glad you made it. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, but yeah, no, it, it, it's great. And, you know, it's like uh, when I tell people, you know, something that won't make or break your salvation, but I've come to the belief where now I believe in the flat earth theory and only because there's a two letter word that I've missed my whole life. And I, I tell people this is this was the game changer for me was because that word in in Genesis did y'all ever notice that when God separated the waters above and below and and, and uh, created the sun, moon, and stars and 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 uh, set them in the firmament, not outside? I'm like, wait, what? And that's why, you know, now when I look, and that's that yeah, makes sense why you see the sun and moon in the sky at the same time sometimes, and they're rotating because it's like a clock. Now would make better sense why, you know, when he uh, stopped the the sun and turned turned it back ten degrees for. Uh, uh, back in the old, I can't remember the, the prophet's name that he did that for. But, you know, things like that make more sense now. And that's just me. You know, I'm like, it's just interesting things you start learning when you really start paying attention to what you're reading instead of just reading like a book. Yeah, because let God be true and every man a liar. That's how I look at things now. But anyway, yeah, good, good, good seeing you all. Yeah, you too. Absolutely. <laughs> That's good. That's all I have to say. I know everybody needs to. There you go. <laughs> but yeah, so we've got uh, we've got that. I'm glad, I'm glad to see uh, you're able to make it. And uh, yeah, we pretty much have uh, this uh, for today's study. And then, uh, like I said, we'll be back here Wednesday, uh, 4:45. We've got uh, next Sunday. We'll be back here again at 12:25. And then uh, that chat room on Facebook is always available for. Uh, for any kind of question, anytime it's like a 24 seven chat room, you can always ask questions. People can always you know, reach out to each other and uh, answer each other's questions or discuss you know, certain things. And there again, everyone's at different levels. So there's people on, on, on different uh, levels of uh, understanding. So as we're all, you know, helping each other out, getting each other ready and, uh, you know, for the judgment seat of Christ, which we're happy to go to, uh, it's gonna be, you know, some, you know, where we all get each other ready and we all edify each other and help each other out. So, so yeah. Yep. Awesome stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So, I don't know if there's anything else, but uh, we can wrap up here and then I'll be back here on Wednesday. If that's, uh, if that's all for today. If you want to... yeah, so. 
Yeah. Okay. So we'll uh, we'll wrap up and we'll uh, see each other uh, later. We'll be there on the chat room anytime you need us. All, All right. right, John. Sounds good. Y'all be safe. Yep. Yeah, you know, take care.